Hey, it's Carrie Kasem, and you're watching Flashback Tonight. Subscribe. From beautiful North Hollywood, California, it's Flashback Tonight, starring Delius. Tonight's guest is a successful radio and TV host, and also the daughter of the legendary Casey Kasem. Carrie Kasem is here. She is the daughter of the legendary radio DJ, Casey Kasem, as well as being a successful TV and radio host in her own right. Put your hands together for Carrie Kasem. Hey. How are you? Carrie, first of all, you are beautiful. Thank you. Casey Kasem did something right, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> now, your dad was a legendary uh, radio DJ, but he also did a lot of voiceovers a lot of people may not know, one most notably being the voice of Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. Did y'all know that? <laughs> Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. Yeah. You know? Yeah, people freak out when they hear that. Yeah, they really do. What kind of a dad was Shaggy? Shaggy, you know, <laughs> he was so unlike that character completely. But, you know, he did, he hosted and created the American Top 40. No, and, no. I mean, huge humanitarian. But when you say he was Shaggy on Scooby-Doo, people uh -huh. freak out. They just freak out. I mean, he did 350 cartoon voices. No, oh, wow. Yeah. That is a lot of cartoon yeah. voices. There's another one from G-Force that I love. A lot of people don't know about G-Force, yeah. but I recognize him for that yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Transformers. Um, oh, he did the Transformers yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah. He, he was pretty busy. He was pretty busy. Now, tell me, as far as... Um, you said he wasn't very strict or wasn't, wasn't like... Oh, oh, no, he was strict. Oh, he was strict. But Shaggy was like a hippie and, you know... He... Shaggy was kind of like that weed head friend yeah, we all had that, that nobody wanted to let you know exactly. he was a weed head. But, yeah, exactly, they couldn't actually but he say was that. not like that. Yeah. So now being the daughter of a, a legendary guy and growing up with that, you would think that, you know, daddy's little girl got everything she wanted to get. Did <laughs> he, no? <laughs> no? It was so not like my dad. People always thought, you know, we got everything. We... My dad, I'll tell you a story about my dad. Um, my 16th birthday, I'm going to Beverly Hills High School. All the kids have, you know, these amazing cars. It looks like some exotic, like, rental car lot. That's Beverly Hills High Beverly School. It's Beverly Hills High School. It's ridiculous, <laughs> right? So I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to get a car. I'm going to get to take my brother and sister to school. I can help out mm -hmm. the family. And so three weeks before my 16th birthday, I say, Dad, give me a hint. Come on, just a hint. And he says, okay, it's silver. And I thought, okay, silver is cool. All right, so my first choice, but okay, silver's cool. <laughs> Week goes by, Dad, give me another hint, give me another hint. Okay, it's metal. And I went and I told all of my friends I'm getting a car. My mom, every, we were so <laughs> stoked. Week before my 16th birthday, Dad, give me my last hint. I have to know, begging him. Even my sister and brother got into this. We were so excited. He says, okay, it's got keys. <laughs> I was so excited. My 16th birthday comes around. There's a huge box on my dad's, uh, yeah, in the living room, and I'll never forget this. I'm like, okay, he's not a huge gift giver. It was here, one, one or two things, and that was it. And, and so I'm like thinking, okay, well, maybe he's buried the keys in it. So I go over, and I open it up, and there's this styrofoam thing, and it was very heavy. So my sister and brother come over, <laughs> and we all go down there to pick it up, and we set it down, and we take off the styrofoam, and there it is. It's metal, it's silver, it had keys all right, it was my brand new typewriter. <laughs> a typewriter? A typewriter? Uh, yeah, a car? I wasn't getting good enough grades. I didn't have a job. How was I going to pay for it? It's Casey Kasem. You don't have to pay for it. You know what? I'll tell you something. My dad gave me things that were invaluable, and that was a life lesson. Right. Right? Yeah. Well, what, what, what kind of typewriter? Was it like at least a high-end typewriter? I was so was upset. Like... I honestly, if you could, you know that bitmoji where everything's on fire and you're like angry? <laughs> that was me, but I was smiling. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> he sat down next to me. He literally pulled the typewriter up, sat right here, and he's like, look at this, Carrie. And he starts typing, and then he hits the backspace, and the letter disappeared. He's like, <laughs> you don't have to use whiteout. <laughs> <laughs> So excited. That was, was high in there. So upset. The, the ones where you could hit the backspace and not have to. That was right. high in. That was like super the IBM high 2000 or yeah, something like that. It was that super in high end. I used it once and then I was so angry. I, it sat in my closet. Oh, you didn't forever. take it to school to show off to all your friends? I mean, it was heavy. No. This is, I'm old. So it was very heavy. 
So uh, you don't carry these things around. This sat on my, like, he wanted it on my desk <laughs> and for me to do type out my homework. Oh, wow. Yeah, it wasn't happening. All right, so <laughs> you've kind of followed in your dad's footsteps a little yeah. bit, becoming your own successful TV and radio host. I was looking at your resume, and you've done, like, just about everything. <laughs> yeah. like, but the one thing that, that, that I'm going to say shocked me, because it's not like you couldn't do it, but I'm a big MMA fan. Yeah. You were a host of uh, UFC? MMA? I was. I was. Very interesting. Here's another funny story. I <laughs> can't believe I'm going to tell you this. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm dating this guy. And he's a huge MMA guy, huge. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really into it. I wasn't even into fighting. I didn't like people beating each other up. I did take Kempo Karate when I was a kid. I got kicked in the stomach once. I was out of there. <laughs> Done. I'm like, I'm, this is not for me. So I, I, he's like, would you like to go to an, an MMA fight, a UFC fight? OK, sure. We head to Vegas. We go to the Mandalay Bay. I'm sitting here. You know, the ex is sitting here. And I'm looking around. I'm, we're halfway up in this stand. And there's the octagon. I'm watching this. And I, I'm. I'm this is cool, I'm watching the fight, but what I'm really focused on is the host, this gorgeous blonde named Lisa Durgan. Uh -huh. I think she was a playmate, she was stunning. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, I could do a better job than Lisa. I'm a, I'm a good host, I could uh -huh. host this, I could, I could do. So I turn to this guy and I say, well, I, I can do a better job than Lisa. You put on blast like that? Yeah, and she's, he goes, oh yeah, right. Like you could ever have Lisa Durgan's job. Oh. That uh -oh. bit moji with the fire. <laughs> I'll tell you something. I got rid of him. And I, <laughs> and I said, I literally said to myself, who do I have to call? Who do I need to put myself in front of? What do I need to do to get that job? So what I did was I, I took my reel, I took my uh, headshot, I wrote a letter, and I sent it. I found out the guy I needed to send it to was Dana White from Zoo for Productions. You found his email? I found him, On yeah. the internet? So I, no, I, I, I don't, did I have internet? <laughs> I don't know, did oh, I have? Wow. Yes, I did, I did, I did. But it was very limited. Uh -huh. So I found Zoo for Productions and I found the president uh -huh. and it was Dana White. So I wrote him and nothing. A couple months later, wrote him again, did the same thing, sent my reel, nothing. A few months later, I call up and I ask for Dana White and he gets on the phone. What? Yeah, and I say, I really want to host. I'm a really good host. Did you get my package? He goes, it's sitting on my desk, but we're not hiring. We're not hiring right now, but if we are, I'll take a look at it. And I'm like, but I, I'm good, you know, and I'll work for free. I'll show you. He's like, you know, I really appreciate your enthusiasm. Not right now. So I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? I buy a ticket to the UFC. I wait for him at an after, like, fight party thing. That stalking, I, Carrie. Yeah, a little bit. Little That's stalker. Stalking. Little stalker. <laughs> Little stalker. So I wait for him and I tell the bouncer because I have no idea what he looks like. Point out Dana White when he walks by. Just I'm I'm gonna sit here until that guy walks in. I get a nudge a few minutes later. That's Dana. I walk up to him, tap him on the shoulder. Dana, Carrie Kasem, I want to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> Total stalker. And he's like, oh yeah. He's like, oh, it's great. He's like, you know, look, we are really not hiring, but I will let you know. Moving on. A month later, he calls me up. He said, listen, I'm in town. I'm with a couple fighters. Meet me at a morning show. And, I, and they were on this news morning show. I walk in. It's the two biggest fighters, Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell. Uh -huh. And I'm like, because at this point, I have read everything. I know everything. Okay. I can talk shop. I knew him. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. He invites me to Mastro's that night. There's Joe Rogan. There's Joe Silva. There's, you know, PR guy, Dana, the fighters, everybody, and me. And I'm talking shop. I'm holding my own. I'm thinking, I'm in. <laughs> Nothing. A month goes by, two months goes by. Finally, I get a call, and he said, and, and no, I, it's, it's Joe Silva. And we start talking, and I say, Joe, what do I got to do? What do? And for some reason, Joe Silva mentions that Dana White likes black chapstick. <laughs> right, that was my thing. Oh, wait, what? What's black chapstick? What is black chapstick? What's black chapstick? That's what I said. Black like chapstick. black chapstick. He goes, you know the kind, the original with the black wrapper. Oh. So I said, oh, and a light went off in my head. I bought a year's supply of black chapstick. I wrapped it up. It was this much chapstick, no joke. Wrapped it up. Sent my sent a letter. Sent it off to Dana White, and and he called me up. He said that you are that is the most uh, innovative. Per, you are so persistent. I'll let you host something. And he, he let me host, uh, it was called um, Ultimate Knockouts for Spike TV. Mm -hmm. And he goes, uh, you know, he's like, it wasn't going to be hosted, but I'll let you. And a month after that, I got my first hosting job with the UFC. Wow. A, less than a year later, I had Lisa Durgan's job. Oh. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. And the boyfriend that said you should never have that? He called me up for tickets. He wanted to meet the fighters. <laughs> <laughs> You were like, ah, uh, nope. You went all acrimony no, on him. You missed nice. out. I was nice. <laughs> so you know a lot about MMA then. What do you think about the whole Conor McGregor thing? Oh, you know, I, I don't. This is really weird. After I stopped working for them, I kind of stopped watching. And I do know a little bit. And, mm -hmm. I, of course, when, when Ronda Rousey was there, I was watching Ronda. Mm -hmm. And I watched some of the girls. I don't keep up with it. So don't. I know people are like, oh, and they come up to me and try and talk. Well, recently he just did something crazy, though. If not even outside the MMA ring. He's, uh, he had a grudge, or one of his fighters had a grudge yeah. with an MMA fighter while he was in Ireland. He jumps on a plane from Ireland with some thugs, comes to the States, and like he throws like a dolly through the glass of a bus cutting people's eyes. Like, who does that? He's going to jail, right? Yeah, he's nuts. He's got to go to jail. Yeah. I don't know if he'll ever find the UFC again. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. I was like, who does that? I'm not in Ireland or anything like That's, that. It was crazy. Um, you've got a new uh, product that you're talking about the, that you go on to Ageless I, and Beauty. Okay, so yes. and Healthy. So I'm 45. Most women will never admit that, especially on TV. But I'm 45. And you look good for 45. Thank you. Right? Botox, filler, everything. You look good for 45. Yeah, so thank you very much. Women don't talk about the stuff that they do. Oh, it's natural. No, it's not natural. It's naturally like, yes, it's hyaluronic acid, which is natural. That's fillers in my face. Botox is natural, uh -huh. <laughs> it's, but it's a toxin. So people Getting use the real this. juice today, right? huh? I'm like, I don't even know what she's talking about. Ironic <laughs> fill, what? Yeah, so it's everything that women do that they don't talk about, you uh -huh. know? So I'm extremely healthy. I was a vegan for 24 years. I'm a vegetarian now, but I also do things that keep me looking young. So I have um, a new platform. It's called Ageless and Healthy, mm -hmm. and it's how to look younger, how to feel better, how to have more energy. Energy. And it's with, you know, like it goes anywhere, runs the gamut from creams to machines. That's what I say. So mm -hmm. anything from lasers, I talk about everything I've ever done to myself. I am I, I, no hold, no, like no holds barred. I am completely open about it where I see so many women are embarrassed to talk about it. Right. It's like, you know, you get your hair dyed and you don't pretend that, you know, you know, you don't lie about it. No, my hair isn't white. I don't have any grays. No, that's all natural, you know? <laughs> but so women don't, and I've, I've kind of opened up that forum and it's really interesting talking to women about that and like um, having them open up and, and talk about it and it's fine over over in England it's like nobody has a problem with it yeah. but here everybody's like Shh, I right. don't say anything yeah. I'm embarrassed of it so I just started talking about it and and adding all everything I've done with health over the years and uh, and it's been really fun and that's my passion project right. I'm still doing my syndicated you know mortgage radio show uh -huh. I still have a law show here on KABC I'm still doing that that pays the bills this is I just started it so I'm I love it. I love what I do. I have so much fun with it. And of course, I'm I um I'm into politics, which is very weird. Uh -oh. I mean, this is yeah. Wait, so I do red or blue? It's neither. It's I'm I'm okay. in, in fact I switched to uh, I I don't even I. I I literally switched it to independent. I don't talk about red or blue. Uh -huh. It's a bill that is bipartisan, meaning both parties love it, and it's anti-elder abuse. So I do that, you oh, know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, um, let's talk about that. I'm not sure if, if everyone remembers this story. You know, your, your, your father passed away a, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, there was this big um, story scandal, yeah. almost like something off of Forensic Files or something yeah. that was going on with his wife mm -hmm. at the time, which was Jean Kasem, not your mother, Yes, um, was doing everything possible to keep the kids from seeing their father That's in his right. last moments as far as moving the body around from state to state. Yeah. What, what, what was going on? Why would she do this something is, like that? It's crazy. And I'm just going to, I'll tell you real quick, you know, uh, uh, my, the last year of my dad's life, she said, basically, you're never going to see your dad again. But not to, just to us kids. His entire family, his brother, his aunts, his uncles, all of his friends, his co-workers, his phone was thrown away, his staff was fired, everything was gone. We couldn't get in to see him. And most people don't know this, but once you turn 18 in this country, you have no rights to see your parents. Zero. What? The police can't help you. Adult Protective Services can't help you. If they're in a residential home and there's an uncooperative caretaker, it doesn't matter if it's somebody with the power of attorney, if it's another sibling, if it's a spouse, a second spouse, it, if they don't want you in their house and they're taking care of your mom or dad, you're not getting in. Wow. You're not getting in. Wow. Done. You'll never see your parent again. And they, they, they won't tell you when they're, when they're sick, when they're going to the hospital, or when they die. I get, I, I mean, I've been doing this four and a half years. I've talked to probably close to a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is happening, it's all over the country. And it's out of spite or for money. And it doesn't matter if you have a dollar in the bank mm -hmm. or a hundred million. Because if you're taking care of some, somebody, you're subsidized. You can get subsidized. You can get money, especially if you're a guardian. 
So how did the how did the, the, the end as far as um, you, you did a judge rule that you I, have the right to? Here, it's another story that I it's a very long one, so I'm not going to go into it. But I was told by my first two lawyers and everyone I knew, you're never going to win guardianship of your dad over a wife of 34 years. You'll never win it. One percent, maybe. Uh, don't try. You're going to lose your house. You're going to lose everything. And I said, I don't care if I lose everything. I'm going to fight. It's your dad. And yeah. yeah. So I told my lawyers, I fired them. I told my brother and sister to get out of my way. I got a lawyer who believed in it. And four months later, we won an impossible fight. I won guardianship over yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But what's crazy, when I won it, uh, she had taken, she had gone to where she hid him in a hospital, unplugged his feeding tube, unplugged his IV, put him in the back of a car, and took him to three different states. That's where you heard what? where she hid him from us. And I found him in Washington. I had to fight up there again because they didn't, recognize. they didn't recognize my guardianship. So I had to wow. fight. I won that, got him to the hospital, but it was too late. He had, he, he, was, passed away. he was dying by the time we got him to the hospital. Yeah. And so you took um, something that was bad and negative like that, and you turned it into a positive yes. by the, the bill that you're sponsoring for the, yes. uh, the LWs. And how, how's that going as far as? We have, we just got our 12th state last yeah. month. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. We just got Maryland, and yeah. I was just in D.C. for the week, and yeah. I, there's three congressmen interested in taking this federally. So it would hit all 50 states yeah. right away. Yes, yeah. yes. It seems yeah. like a no-brainer. I it wish is. somebody would try to keep me from my parents. I would have done exactly what you did, but I would have been, I probably would have a little more ghetto. That's what people said, uh, that, yeah. Uh, let's, let's be real. <laughs> let's be real. I probably would have been a little more ghetto. <laughs> Lawyers be damned. <laughs> I'm telling you now I'm going to jail, but trust me, you... <laughs> and you will. You yeah. will go to jail. I don't mind going I to jail for that. And I didn't either. Yeah. I, I didn't either. I was going to see my dad. So I'm literally fighting in court to see my dad, and I'm in Sacramento every week trying to get the bill passed because either they were going to pass a bill to let me see my dad mm -hmm. or I was going to win in court, either one. So I was literally back and forth, quit my syndicated radio show, yeah. and I just went full out. I didn't think, though, that I would be, you know, at 45, the face of AARP, you know? <laughs> 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 right? But I'm proud of it. I, you know, I, I love what I do. <laughs> well, we're, we're running out of time. Can you come back again and see oh, us and share some more stories? I'd love to. Yeah. You guys, put your hands together for Carrie Kasem. <laughs> Kerry Kasem, and you're watching Flashback Tonight. Subscribe.